<coughs> All right, guys. Um, we'll just jump into this. Welcome back to open water, um, confined water uh, portion two, uh, class two. Uh, we're going to go back through and uh, we'll kind of recap a little bit what we've already talked about. And we've got all kinds of new stuff to go over as well. And I brought props today um, to help explain things a little bit more easily. Um, again, my name is Benjamin Hadfield. I am a uh, master instructor as well as a technical dive instructor. And, and you saw my wife is running around here um, going and get us dinner. And she will uh, um, be helping on the service support today as well. Um, as we kind of go through this, again, I want you guys to kind of think about the idea of open water scuba is really this is first grade, right? We're just just getting the idea that we don't eat the paste and we uh, we use crayons for coloring instead of uh, throwing at people, right? And so this is kind of our first step. And in just the same way, you wouldn't put a 16 year old on on the freeway in L.A. Um, hopefully, you wouldn't. Um, yeah, the same thing with this. We're giving you the basic school the, the basic skills to kind of make your way through the process. We're going to give you a good idea of buoyancy, but at that point, um, buoyancy is still Kind of it'll be still a bit of a mystery after this we'll get you in position we'll get you the idea of it but as you kind of go through this realize that there's ways to improve that so like an advanced driving class would be uh, for a 16 year old we have our version called perfect buoyancy um, as well and that program we take bring in for two to three sessions and all we do is we talk about buoyancy and uh, we have drills and I, I i've got a fun little fun little drills and skills that i, I run you through i, I set up lines Get you practicing running along the line. Get you practicing picking things up, building cairns um, on the bottom of the pool. We'll do a little bit of that open water, and we'll get you the idea. But mainly, the goal with my open water is to keep you from crashing the bottom, get you into a basic position, and uh, get you the idea that if something happens, what to do, and give you the basic skills of breathe underwater. That's what that's what I'm trying trying to teach you. So, perfect buoyancy is a great course, as you saw last uh, on Monday. I had a uh, a couple from a, cl a couple classes ago um, that had come in. And that's what they were doing. They were doing their perfect buoyancy um, and uh, practicing and having fun and learning. And that's their overall goal. Um, SSI has free recognitions as you kind of go through this process. And uh, so the first recognition that you can get to is after you do 12 dives and two specialties, you can become a specialty diver. After that, um, four dives and or 24 dives and four specialties. The next step after that is advanced open water diver. And you'll see, you'll actually see this a fair amount. You'll start going on trips. Um, and uh, you'll see boats going out and they'll, they'll say advanced AOW or advanced open water divers. Um, it means what they're doing is just a little bit bigger dives, um, a little bit, which require a little bit more skill. Um, so they're starting to move you up the raceway, if you will, and, and get you on the freeway and, and do some more challenging dives. Maybe they're deeper, maybe they're more drift, maybe they're more current. Um, there's something about them that they want to make sure that you have a little bit more skill um, to jump you know, onto this instead of just basic. Um, the highest the highest level that you can go as a recreational diver uh, is the master diver. And that's four specialty programs, 50 log dives, and stress and rescue. Um, and we can do all these as a mentorship as well. And we, what we do is we ask you to come in and, and work with us individually to try and figure out what you want. It will help you guide you into classes. I've got a young lady that I just worked with last night. Did a, worked on her deep dive class, and she's going to take altitude with us, coming out and doing dives with us and learning that process. But we help guiding her through what she wants to do and where she wants to go. And so... And the other good news is, is because you're starting in January, it should be easier for you guys to get to Master Diver. Um, and SSI does have a Master Diver challenge um, that if you get to Master Diver by the end of the year, they put you on a digressor for seven days. So um, I just talked to somebody yesterday who uh, actually is um, the director of ecology for the aggressor fleet. Um, and uh, she calls it princess diving because there's somebody that picks up your tanks and puts them on the thing. And there's somebody, once you get on the deck, they, they take your tanks for you and they, they run off and do something with them. And when you're ready to get back in the water, they put it, there's a new tank on your BC and they, and all you have to do is just step off the, off the water and then you get back out and you, you know, have your, your cocktails and your, your sandwiches and whatever you're doing. So SSI does have some, um, if you make advanced diver or advanced open water or specialty diver this year as well, they do have some uh, drawings and some cool stuff for that as well. Um, but the biggest one is for the master diver. Again, as we kind of go through this, I really want you guys to think, where do I want my diving journey to go? What does that look like to me? What kind of dives do I want to do? And the, you know, the easy answer is always, I want to see pretty fish on a reef. Well, the good news is 72% of the water, the earth is covered water, there's lots of reefs, there's lots of fish, but there's also other cool things out there. Um, we've talked about nitrox, absolutely, if you want to dive, have longer dives, safer dives, more energy after dives. Um, then Nitrox is for you, and we've got that coming up next Friday as well. So I definitely encourage signing up for that. Um, navigation is a great one if you if you like knowing where you're at and how to navigate underwater. It's definitely to your advantage. Um, and we teach uh, you know 
for civil courses. We do a land, uh, land nav course, and then we do a, a water nav course. And it's um, giving you the idea how to use a compass and how to work through that process. Um, deep diving is one of my favorites. I was teaching that last night, as a matter of fact. And cool things happen in the deep. There's a lot of cool stuff past the 60-foot mark. Um, some of the, uh, and the cool thing is, is the deeper you go, the less people have been there, right? So if you go out and, you, and you're diving like the Kitty Walk, Kitty Wake um, in the Caribbean, um, that's a 50-foot rick, everybody and their mother has dove it, right? Everybody's seen it. But if you want to do something a little more challenging on Fort Lauderdale is the Lady Luck. Her, uh, she sits at about 140 foot in the sand, 128 foot on the deck, uh, on the lower deck, and about 115 at the tower. So she's definitely deeper. First time I ever saw a fireworm um, was at, on the uh, Lady Luck. Very cool. It's a fuzzy wuzzy. They're about this long, about this wide, about that tall. And they're beautiful red. And they have all these little fuzzy wuzzies. And you don't touch them because all those little fuzzy wuzzies are neurotoxin. So look, don't touch is always the rule of thumb. Um, so cool stuff happens deep. Night and limited viz is another favorite. Um, cool stuff comes out at night. That's where you usually get your octopus, your, your lobsters, your crabs. I saw the biggest hermit crab I'd ever seen in my life on a night dive and, uh, off of Coast Kona. I kid you not, he was this big. And he was a fast little booger too. Um, so you see cool things come out at night. Um, other fun things, um, if you were looking for additional safety, stress and rescue is a, one of my favorite courses to teach. It's really lots of fun for me. Maybe not fun for you. I'm just kidding. It's our goal is to help you find and understand stress in your life and what those what that looks like, and then put you in, in controlled stressful situations in the water, and show you how to handle those uh, in a in a re, uh, cool way. Um, we usually pair that up with React Right, which is your CPR, your AED, first aid, and O2 provider, so that you're able to utilize those things safely. But there's other cool things, wreck diving. Is definitely a lot of fun. I, lo I love wrecks. Nikki likes fish. Um, we uh, we see cool fish on wrecks, so works out good for both of us. Um, I dive a lot of side mount, um, science of diving. If you like the science of things, I love it. It's one of side mount. side mount is where you put tanks on your side instead. If you kind of look at the picture here, you can see he's got a tank here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so he's diving side mount. So there's a tank here and a tank here. So instead of having tanks on your back, you put them underneath you, uh, right on right under your armpits. Um, and it gives you, um, you get a lower sack rate because you're more streamlined in the water and it's easier to dive. And the trim on it, if you're diving back mount, this is what diving back mount balance is like. You're always kind of working balance, right? This is how you balance side mount. So it's like, it's like diving by laying on your coffee table. You don't have to think a lot about balance and you don't, you're, you're forced into balance. It's how I primarily dive. Um, and uh, the nice thing is, is you, once you get into side mount, you can take it as far as you want with the same rig. You can do, do up to six tanks in side mount, um, from one tank to six tanks. So it's a, it's a great way to go, and it's a lot less pressure on your back. So with this certification, how deep do you dive in the water? Great. Special? That's a great question. 60 feet. 60 feet, okay. Yep. So I'm certifying you guys to 60 feet open water. Yeah. With a, uh, a, to be able to dive autonomously with an equally or more qualified buddy. Nope. Um, this, uh, you can still get a deco at 60 feet. Um, it has to do with the nitronarcosis. Uh, so nitronarcosis becomes a factor after 60 feet. And the, the shallowest known case of uh, um, nitronarcosis was 60 feet. So they, they cut it off at 60 feet to make your life easier. And we're going to go over nitronarcosis this evening. So some other cool things. I, they have photo, video, wave size and currents, fish identification, shark ecology. All, these are all things I can teach. I, there's only two specialties I, I don't teach. I don't teach scooter and I don't teach gas blending. So uh, more advanced classes as you start moving up the, the chain. Full face mask diving. I love diving my FFM, my full face mask. It is just really comfortable and awesome. It gives you a bitter, big field of view and you can breathe through your nose and through your mouth at the same time. Um, so there's, and water doesn't get in as well. Um, you do go through a little bit more air because of that, but bigger field of view. And it, if you are uh, prone to getting cold, uh, full face is definitely for you. Um, Altitude diving, if you're going to dive around here, is definitely a way to go. Independent diving, it's not really designed to teach you to dive by yourself. Um, it's more te to independently of others, more accurately. So it's a great course. I love teaching it. It's a lot of fun for me. My goal is to teach people how to um, be resource divers. The full face mask is not good for testing? No, no, not at all. I've seen plenty of people in, uh, you'll see a lot of photographers do it. Um, you'll, uh, and, uh, in the open water, um, and I've seen plenty of people, um, in open, in, uh, warm, sunny places do it. It just, 
it's a little bit more expensive to get into, but once you're into it, it's absolutely wonderful. I, I absolutely love my FFM. It's actually hard to get Nikki out of her FFM um, when the water gets warmer. So she she sticks with it till the last possible minute, and then uh, she'll switch back, switch back over. Because um, some of the places we dive, it's it's not as convenient to dive at FFM because we do long swims to get out to them. So if you're having to do a really long swim, it's not as convenient. But once you get it on, it's it is absolutely awesome. Um, the your mask your mask field never uh, never fogs um, because the way it is is so you have a, a nose piece right here, and then on top of the nose piece, the air comes out just above it um, onto the wind the windscreen. So if it does fog. Um, once you start breathing and go down, it'll clear. You can actually add comms to them as well. Nikki and I have comms. We haven't actually ever used our comms, but uh, we, we haven't needed to, but you can actually uh, push the talk and use comms. But you get a bigger field of view, a much bigger field of view. Um, and they're comfortable. I, I really like to have an FFM. Um, as you start getting move, uh, more up the chain, uh, you can start getting what they call extended range, and this is where you go deeper and stay a lot, a lot longer. You start doing multiple tanks and crazy stuff like that. Uh, again, we use our mentorship program, so if you guys are interested in that, please let us know. We're happy to help guide you through the process and, and help you with that. So we used a little bit of BC on Monday. So the purpose of the BC was what, guys? All of the above. All of the above, yeah. Control ascent and descent. Um, all, um, provide flotation of the surface and maintain neutral buoyancy during the dive. And as you guys got started getting down, you kind of realize that you add a little bit of air and you can float above, right? That that dynamic, right? And uh, as or you get want to get to the surface, you just, it's full of air and you will float very nicely. The three basic rules of scuba stated in the proper order of importance are what? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, you're good. Oh, sorry. It is D. Breathe continuously. That's the number one rule of scuba. Ascend slowly, maintain your control, and never dive alone or beyond your level of training. So the three best rules of scuba, got them. They're super important. Never hold your breath. In fact, I, I see this happen a lot with uh, um, people. I'm t I'm taking up the chain, and I start teaching. One of the ways we take you up the chain is I have I get you in the pool, and I get you in buoy into buoyancy. And we start doing skills like remove your mask, um, drop your regulator, things like that in trim, in, in the diver position. And I can, I can usually tell what's going on because if I, if I get you buoyant and you're hovering and we're just looking at each other, you're not moving, you're breathing normally and we, you're comfortable. And I ask you to do something and you float up or you crash the bottom, I know what of two things happened. I know you let all your air out and held your breath or I know you took a deep breath and held your breath. So... You, you changed your breathing pattern, right? You, you, um, and, and went to holding your breath. And I, I see it all the time. So always breathe. It's just huge. Um, the next, second row, always make sure you ascend slowly. Maintain control about this. And I can't tell you, uh, talk about this enough, but the idea of this is that I'm teaching you guys to do nothing. Did you watch that video? I, I did. I've seen that before, actually. Um, so your old goal is focus on this square foot of ocean. And when you get that one figured out, spend a little more time with it and then move on. Take your time. This is not a speed sport. There, there's no Michael Phelps um, and no gold medals for first place. Your goal should literally be who can come in last place. That really is your overall goal with this process is who can come in last place. Because the person that comes in last place will see the most. Absolutely. And the third rule is never dive alone or beyond your level of training. And you notice it doesn't say beyond your comfort level. Right, it should, but I they 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 keep that out of there because they want you just because I'm comfortable doing a dive doesn't mean I'm ready to do that dive. I've seen plenty of divers come out that want to do tech with me, for example, and I teach a fair amount of tech classes. Um, but, and I have people come from all over. I've, my last student came from California um, to uh, flew out here specifically to take tech courses with me. What's well, a tech uh, tech different than it? Yes, multiple tanks, deep, long um, dives. And, uh, but I had a student come out uh, that was super excited pushing into this and just wasn't ready. They were comfortable getting in the water, but watching their skills and watching what was going on, they were absolutely not ready to do that dive in any way, shape, or form. So don't sit on that table, please. So they were, um, so 
just because you're comfortable doing something doesn't mean you're ready to do something. So stay within your level uh, and don't dive alone, right? So buoyancy is a pretty basic idea. The idea with buoyancy is that we have a buoyancy compensator. And as we press down, um, an equal and opposite force will press back up. Just like the, the laws of physics, right? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? So the idea of buoyancy comes from Archimedes. So the, the, the quick story about Archimedes is um, one day the king came to him and said, hey, I, I think the goldsmith has ripped me off. I gave him a, an amount of gold and jewels, and he was to make me a crown, and I don't think he used all the gold as he was supposed to. Can you figure it out? Here's the crown, and here's the amount of gold I gave him. Can you determine how much gold he used, or if, did he use the whole amount of gold? Archimedes was a pretty brash guy, and he said, sure, I'm a smart guy, I can figure that out. And he went home and said, how the hell am I going to figure this out? He had no idea. And so... He's contemplating, how am I going to do this process? And one day he hops in the, the hot, hot water of his tub and he realizes that as he gets in, the water level rose. He was denser than the water, right? And so as he, he buoyed that back up, he realized that different densities of, of weight and um, of material would uh, cause different amounts of water to raise. So if it's very dense, it would cause more. If it was less dense, it would cause less. Simple enough. And so he, he ended up measuring out the crown and for the, uh, unfortunately for the goldsmith, found out that the goldsmith had ripped the king off. Probably not the best idea um, overall. So the idea of basically our buoyancy compensator is that it's creating buoyancy by displacing water. It's, it's creating displacement, right? It's, so it's very uh, uh, porous, if you will. It's a lot of air creating a lot of displacement. So because it's light, it has a lot of displacement, it causes us to buoy up, right? And there's three types of buoyancy that we're going to deal with in this class. What are the three types of buoyancy you think? What do you think? So they're kind of like flying. So there's three problems with flight. Lift, sustain lift, and, and control, right? So basically, the, the idea is, is negative or positive buoyancy would be lift. Negative buoyancy would be less lift. And, and, and neutral buoyancy, staying in the same position. Three types of buoyancy, negative, positive, and neutral. That's what we're looking for overall. So the challenge with this is, is that we tend to float a bit, and our wetsuit's going to float, and our buoyancy compensator is going to float. So one of the things we do with this, our buoyancy compensator, is we add a little bit of weight so we can sink in the water column, right? And then as we add that air, it displaces more water, causing us to rise in the water column. Now, a couple of things. It wants us to go over care and maintenance of our buoyancy compensator system. It's pretty simple stuff. As you get out of the water, rinse it off with water. Um, after you get done with a dive trip, um, or you, uh, if you're diving a lot in open water, you can unscrew um, one of the uh, dump valves on your BC, and you can fill that bladder up with water because water will get into your bladder, and you can rinse that salt out. And you also want to make sure you uh, rinse off well any moving parts or pieces of your, your, dry, your uh, BC as well. Um, for example, those weight pockets that just popped out so easily, um, salt can get in there and actually freeze those buckles together. And it, it'll do a really good job of freezing those together, I promise you, um, as well. So the inflators, it, it, they'll absolutely ruin those inflators. So you want to make sure you rinse it well with clean water. Um, after diving um, at the uh, Belmont, when we go there, you'll want to take those home. My suggestion is take everything that you took into Belmont, um, take it into your shower, just rinse it off with the shower. Just make sure on the... On the uh, on your regulator that you put the, the dust cap back on because we don't want to get water into the regulator. Easy enough. So the effects of pressure into water. Uh, one of the things that we realize is that we've got a couple different kinds of um, pressure. We have absolute pressure and we have gauge pressure. Now the absolute pressure is what we're dealing with right now. We're dealing with absolute pressure, which is all the pressure around us. When we get in the water, that's still absolute pressure. The challenge with that is, is the way the gauges that we're working with um, they don't use absolute pressure because if they did, automatically, as soon as we got in the water, it would give us a different, it wouldn't give us a zero to 33 feet. It would, it would be measuring whatever we had at the surface. So they're zeroed out for surface tension, and we call them gauge pressure. So they're zeroed out to the first point, so they'll be able to register correctly. Now, as we go down to the water column, we're starting to have pressure work around us, right? 
So we start working in the, the dynamic of atmospheric pressure around us. Now, the, this is set in, in feet fresh water, but we can also deal with feet seawater. Now, feet, the difference between uh, a full atmospheric change in fresh water is 34 feet, and the difference between, in seawater is 33 feet. Why do you think it's different? Why do you think it's shallower in salt water versus fresh water? I'm thinking we're turning to like the density of salt versus fresh water for non carriers. Yeah. Salt. Yeah. It's, it's heavier. Yeah. So we need less of it to make the same amount of weight. So as we deal with this, 33 feet um, seawater, FSW, feet seawater, is going to be one atmosphere. 66 feet is going to be two atmospheres, and so on, and so on, and so on. And this, this is how we kind of measure the pressure of depth. Um, so as we kind of go through this, we need to be aware that we're at one atmosphere right now. As we descend in the water column, we'll get down to uh, two atmospheres, and then three atmospheres, and four atmospheres, and so on. And ATA just means atmosphere. Atmospheric okay. pressure, yep. Gotcha. Is atmosphere the same as a bar? Mm -hmm. Basically. Okay. It's, they're, okay. they're slightly different, but for a period of our argument and discussion, bar and atmosphere are the same thing. So they're slightly different, but not really. Um, so uh, you would, and so we'll keep it at that for the simple answer overall. So the thing remember about, this is primary school. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> we're going to keep it very simple for you. So as we go down, we we also have to realize that there's a pressure change as we go down. So at one atmosphere, we're dealing with one atmospheric pressure or pressure around us is what we're used to, right? We go down to 33 feet seawater, 34 feet fresh water. We've got a two atmosphere, so that's a 50 percent change. It's really twice as um, much pressure around us as what we're accustomed to at the surface. Now, as we go down to 66 feet or 68 feet fresh water, um, now there's a 33% change. As we go down to uh, 99 feet of seawater or 102 feet fresh water, it's a 25% change. So each time it halves itself down. So as we talked about earlier, the, the downside of, of open water scuba is we are limiting you guys to 33 feet. You're absolutely working in the most uncomfortable environment in diving that you'll deal with. You'll, the greatest amount of pressure change. It literally is a double pressure change to 33 feet. And now, just be aware, we're at altitude of uh, 4,800 feet here, so it's actually a little shallower um, change of that as well. So we're actually, uh, if you talk 33 feet at, at um, or 27 feet is, is equal to 33 feet uh, at sea level. So mm. you're in the most comfortable, uncomfortable environment you can possibly be in as well. So absolute pressure is defined as Yeah, the total pressure. It's the absolute pressure of the total pressure. <coughs> so the effects of pressure on the surface and versus underwater is, is referred to by Boyle's Law, and Boyle was kind of a crazy guy. Um, he was a Scot um, in the uh, 1600s, and he was doing experiments on physics by putting snakes in uh, sealed containers, uh, putting them on a string, and throwing them into the ocean. Sounds like fun. So, it sounds like a 12-year-old to me, but um, he was a, a famous physicist. And his basic law says that as pressure increases, volume decreases. And talking about gas, as pressure decreases, volume increases. Pretty simple, right? And the, he wrote out the formula as pressure one times volume one is equal to pressure two times volume two. That didn't make any sense to me. But I, it, I, I, it doesn't. Okay. So listen, we'll, <laughs> we're going to keep it nice and simple. As as, um, as pressure increases, volume decreases. They have an inverse ratio, right? And that's what he's really trying to tell you is that if I put uh, one times two on one side, and then I can uh, on the other side it'd be equal to two times one. It comes out the same because as the pressure increases one, the volume decreases and they, they increase and decrease equally, right? And so they're, overall they'll be equal because you have a higher number with one and a lower number with one or a lower number with one and a higher number with the other. So they become equal. So as we look at this, if we start thinking about this in maybe just a little bit simpler terms like a balloon, if I take a balloon that has one cubic feet of air and I take it down to 33 feet seawater, it halves out. So instead of having a whole cubic foot, now it has a half a cubic foot. If I take it down to three atmospheres, which is 66 feet, it goes to a third. So it's a third of a cubic foot. And at 99 feet, it's a quarter of a cubic foot. Simple enough? 
Now, if we think about that in terms of our the tank of gas that we have on our back, this is an 80 cubic foot tank of gas that we're breathing, right? And the way we think, the reason we call it 80 cubic feet is it, it holds under pressure enough air to fill 80 cubic feet or about a phone booth. Okay, so if I take that down, that 80 cubic foot tank down to 33 feet, it's now equal to 40 cubic feet. And at 66 feet, it's equal to 30 cubic feet. And at 99 feet, it's equal to 20 cubic feet of air. Make sense? Now, that's important because as we go through this process, we want to make sure we understand that my lungs don't change in size. No matter what this stupid little picture says, <laughs> my lungs don't change in size. I hate, I'm going to, one, day, one of these days, I'm going to change this picture. Do I go from six foot two to five foot eight? Or exactly, you know? right? And that's one of the things I, I ask people is, is, do your lungs change size as you go down? And I have people argue with me all the time. Oh, yes, they do. And I says, well, does your foot change in size? Well, no. Does your hand change in size? Well, no. Why would your lungs change in size? And same size chest, right? And they're like, oh, okay. So they, they get it, right, overall. Um, so as we go through that, uh, it compresses things down. So we is start... It like the interior of the gets compressed or the air gets compressed? The, the gas itself is compressed. Yeah, and so we're, the air itself is compressed. Exactly. So we look at this, this up here. So we have the same amount of gas, one liter of gas. We compress it. It's now half a liter of gas, but we still have the same amount of molecules in it. So that's where the, my sponges come in. This is, I, I actually learned, I had to figure this out for a, an 11 year old who's taking my class. So if we thought about each one of these sponges as the air we're breathing, and they're actually pretty close, right? If you think about it, 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen. This is what we're breathing at the surface. As we go down to 33 feet, they compre compress. And now we can put two molecules in the same one cubic inch square. As we go down to 66 feet, now we can fit three molecules in the same one cubic inch of air. They compress, just like sponges do. They get smaller and, they, and they're compressed out. As we come back up to 33 feet, now we only have two molecules in the one cubic, uh, cubic inch of air. And as we get to the surface, it, it uncompresses. So here, well, this was uncompressed. Um, and now we have one molecule of air in one cubic inch of air, in, in one cubic inch. So does that make sense? A little, is that a little bit easier? Okay. Does that mean I need twice as much air? Yeah, that's my question. Is like how it affects demand. On absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You you'll go you'll go through your gas faster is more accurate. Um, gotcha. So, um, if you're planning on if you know that you can use um, if you breathe 80 cubic feet of air in two hours on the surface just sitting there, and you go down to 33 feet, you'll know that that same tank of gas will only last you an hour. Mm -hmm. okay. And then if you go down to 66 feet, you know that it's going to last you one third of the time. So if it's right. two hours, now it's uh, 45 minutes, yeah. right? And so on and so on. So that's where deep diving gets really kind of tricky. And one of the reasons you see people carry so many tanks, you know, you, you guys saw my twin sets over there. There's two tanks back there. Why would any individual in their right mind for any good reason throw two tanks on their back when they weigh 45 pounds each, right? That, they didn't have six tanks. Back exactly, back. right? That's a hundred pounds on your back plus a seven pound steel wing or steel plate on, on that as well. So it's when all said and done, that's 110 pounds on your back. It's not light. Why would you want to do that? Well, the only reason you, you do that is because you wanted to be able to stay down longer because you're going deep and you want to be able to stay down long enough on one tank at 130 feet. I know that I can stay down for about 20 minutes, maybe 30 at, at that time. I, I would definitely need some sort of decompression gas or something to get big back up. But on two tanks, I know that I can do that same, same dive and I can stay down twice as long. Now I can suddenly get an hour's worth of uh, bottom time at 130 feet instead of just a half hour. So we carry more tanks because we're going down and we're compressing the gas. We're using Boyle's Law. And so Boyle's Law can work against you and for you as well. In this particular case, it's working against you. You need to realize that as pressure increases, the volume of what you have available to you is decreasing. So that's where it's working against you. Now, there's another time Boyle's Law is going to work for you. So as we look at this balloon, we'll consider this to be our BC, our buoyancy compensator. We're at 99 feet, and we put a quarter of a cubic foot of air into our BC. And we're floating along very nicely. We decide to ascend to 33 feet, but we don't dump any gas. Well, if we don't, what's going to happen? If we're perfectly balanced, we're neutrally buoyant, 
at 99 feet with a quarter of a cubic foot of air in our BC, and we swim without doing anything to 33 feet, will we still be neutrally buoyant? Yes. You think? That's we because the gas is going to expand. We have three times more gas, so if we have three times more gas, we become more buoyant, wouldn't we? Yes. Yeah, we, we're displacing three times the amount of water. If a quarter of a cubic foot of gas displaces just enough water to keep us floating, and we triple that, we're going to float big yeah. time, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what it'll end up happening is if we don't dump the gas before we start our ascent, we're going to become a Triton missile, and, too fast. and we're going to go yeah. way too fast. So this is where um, Boyle's law kind of works against you as well. You got to make sure that you're aware that as you start ascending, that, that you aren't adding. That you aren't adding, and actually you want to be subtracting. Yeah. Okay. As That's well. So, but here's where one of the the places that Boyle's law works for you. If something happens and you ran out of gas and there was nobody around to help you, you leave your regulator in your mouth if you're, if you're at uh, 99 feet and you start your swim. Uh, we're going to try, teach you how to do an emergency swimming ascent and emergency buoyant ascent. That'll be on Monday. Here's the great thing. I, I had a 30 cubic foot tank, a very small tank. It's about this big by about this big around. It was my extra tank and I had a high blend of nitrox in it. And I needed to breathe it off to zero anyway because I wanted to get it filled with something else. Um, and so I had two tanks. I had one on my back and, and this little tank that I needed to breathe off. And so I decided to breathe it off completely. And, and I knew when I ran out of gas on that, I just switched regulars. No big deal, right? I had two tanks. But I was doing a, 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 a special solo class with a student. And we were at 66 feet. And I ran out of gas on that. I was curious. I, was, I thought, we're, gonna, we're ascending now anyway. I wonder how many breaths of gas I will get out of an empty tank from 66 feet to 15 feet. It expands. Well, because it's not expand. empty. Yeah. Not fully empty at that it's, level. It just keeps yeah. expanding. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's empty at the, at the depth, but it won't be empty as we at rise the in the water. At the surface. Yeah. So how many breaths do you think I got? Exactly. I was able, I got, had enough gas in there to have, to be able to do a, a, jet, a soft ascent to 15 feet and still breathe off that tank. Now, when I got to that and got my final breath on that, I did switch because I was again out. But as you're ascending the water column, the gas is expanding again. You'll get more. So even if you're completely out, always keep your regulator in your mouth and do your swim because you'll get another couple of breaths out of that. So it'll definitely save. So Boyle's Law can help you and it can hurt you, right? Yeah, it takes, it does take the gas away and it does give the gas back, right? <laughs> so as we kind of look at that, that's one of the things we want to be aware of is Boyle's Law definitely applies in a lot of different ways. So if we had an object immersed in water and it will be buoyed upward by a force that is blank, the weight of the water it displaces, greater than, equal to, less than, or two times? Equal to. It's that, back to that basic rule of physics, right? Every, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If I uh, punch the water, it's going to punch back at, at an equal force, right? A panic, panic can be prevented by, by the way, these are all test questions. Mm -hmm. What do you think, David? All, all, answers. all answers are absolutely correct. Um, use of my SSI logbook is important because okay. exactly right. This is a lot like the my SSI app is a lot like a flight log. We absolutely log all those important, accurate information about your personal information on your dive. It's got your personal information in there as well. And it also is a great resource that I know if I dove like this here, and I dove like this here, if I come back in two weeks, I could dive like that because I know. Or if I need to make corrections, hey, wait a minute, on these, these three dives, I felt way too heavy. Um, and I had six pounds. So on my next dives, I'll try two pounds, or I'll try subtracting two pounds and go to four pounds instead. And I can make note of that. Okay, two pounds was perfect, or two pounds was slightly too light. Okay, I can add one pound back. And so I can start adding that information. And as the Chinese uh, say, the, the faintest pencil is better than the best memory. I can this is just like taking notes when you shoot. Right? Because you know what. Mm -hmm. Yep. When you're shooting long range, you, you, oh, you, you shoot. shooting. Yeah. 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 And, and so you know when you come back to that same environment, this is what I was mm -hmm. using last time. Mm -hmm. Those are the exact same. Exactly. And that's exactly what we're talking about is. So we haven't. We don't have a MySSI logbook. You do. 
Is it? On the it's app? in. It's in the app. Okay. Because okay. in the videos, I see everybody writing in hard copy. Nope, it's in the app. Okay. Um, so you're able to go in your app. Would you mind lending me your app for a minute, babe? So Nikki stinks at logging dives, but this is your MySSI app. <laughs> and so you can go in here and you can take a look and, and that's all her log dives um, right here. And so you, you can hand log those. It'll also have awards. It'll have statistics for you about your dives. It'll have uh, places that you have dove. Um, it'll also have awards for your dives. Tell you what kind of diver you are, what level, what your deepest dive is, things like that. Um, and um, you'll also have all your information in there as well. So you have a place in here for gear, um, equipment. Let's see. Um, I'm looking right at it, I'm sure. But there's a... There's it's a, the purple mask. Oh, there we go. So you can put your gear in there. And you can log that gear against your dive. Um, and then on each dive, you can go in. It does. And a serial number and picture of it. Um, but it also tell you, um, you know, here's the depth we dove, the duration, the average, all the information you need about to, to log about the dive, um, your CNS, everything will go in here for you. So you'll be able to log that up. And so we enter that in, it doesn't come off our dive. And unfortunately it does not. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask that. I wish it did. Um, yeah. The MySSI app um, only yeah, works, Does it only auto logs with Mari's computers. Um, it's the only computers that they auto log with. Everything else is manual. Okay. Um, so for the most part, we're manual logs. But it gives you all that great information. Yeah. So you log, we'll go through and actually give you that information. So I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on this. Um, this is the scary section um, that we have to go through. And we're going to talk about the effects of pressure underwater and pressure related injuries. Things like arterial gas embolism, metastinal emphysema, subcutaneous emphysema, and pneumothorax. These are the scary things. They're also very rare. So the way the basic respiratory system works in the anatomy, anatomy is that everything comes in through, the, uh, to the, uh, through your mouth, down your throat, into the lungs. Okay. From there, it hits the alveolar. And the alveolar are, are small sponge-like uh, substances, and there's about 200 to 300 million of them in your lungs. <coughs> and what they do is they process the oxygen out of your what you breathe in and put it into the circulatory system so it can go out and comes back to the venous system with carbon dioxide and you breathe out the carbon dioxide well it's breathing in the nitrogen as well um, the nitrogen is a non-bonding chemical and it, it actually goes out and it retains into the, the extremities into the tissue compartments now theoretically there's 13 there are 16 tissue compartments um, overall between fast and slow uh, a fast tissue compartment would be like your brain stem um, your, uh, 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 your spinal column would be a fast tissue compartment. A slow tissue compartment would be fat. It takes um, a while for nitrogen to absorb into the fat, and it takes a while for it to come out of the fat as well. But it's processing that nitrogen into your, into your body, right, as well. Um, so that's what the basic respiratory system does. It, the blood pumps it out and back in, right? It pumps it out and then pumps it in. So as we breathe in oxygen, it, uh, we breathe out carbon dioxide, right? Pretty basic stuff. Um, that's what the basic uh, structure does through the alveolar. So there's a couple different things that happen if you hold your breath or get into a sudden impact. Um, and they're overexpansion injuries. This is where Boyle is working against you. Um, the first one's called an arterial gas embolism or an AGE. And this is where um, through holding our breath, um, air bubbles start to form in the circulatory system. Now, if you remember any of the, the scary movies, uh, Murder, She Wrote movies from the 80s, that's what they always did. They took a big hypodermic needle, they stabbed somebody with it, they filled it up with air, they had a heart attack, right? That was every, seemed like every Quincy or uh, Murder, She Wrote or whatever um, from the 80s, that's what they always did, right? And there's a basic amount of truth to that, right? It's, so as these air bubbles enter the venous system, um, they can go into the heart. They can cause problems in the heart. They can cause problems other places. They can get caught in the arms cause uh, yeah, issues with that where you have numbness. But more important, or where it really gets scary, is they can start getting into your brain and they can start causing embolisms. 
Um, they, can, uh, they cause nausea, dizziness, slurred speech, loss of vision, um, vertigo. Um, they can cause heart attacks, spasms, um, anything like that. And that's where, again, where air bubbles have got into the venous system from holding our breath, basically. Um, metastinal emphysema is a little scarier. It's where um, the, the lung will actually get perforated and the air bubbles will come out of the lungs because they, the lung has been perforated and they'll, get, they'll travel up uh, the metal, into the metastinal cavity and start pressing against the lungs and the heart. Um, typically, when, and looking at the metastinal emphysema, what you'll see is you'll see a, a large pressure at a differentiation in the size of the chest on one side or the other. Okay, it's scary stuff. Um, air bubbles in the metastinal cavity and the chest cavity, not good, right? Subcutaneous emphysema is where they break through and they get under the skin, outside of the chest wall, um, but b below the skin. Uh, typically, what you'll see mostly is uh, it'll look like popcorn or crackling. Um, and uh, a lot of times they'll get cut in the neck. Uh, you'll see the lips bloat um, and puffiness around the eyes. Those are pretty common symptoms of that as well, where it gets kind of scary. And the final one is a uh, pneumothorax, where it get caught, gets caught in the throat structure, um, uh, upper, upper chest in the throat structure, and you'll see uh, massive neck blow-ups, blow you know, this really fat neck. Um, overall, over-expansion injuries can be prevented by simply doing what? Dive properly maintained, high quality dive equipment, learn the correct breathing patterns, reinforced in classroom and open water, and never hold your breath while diving. The, the most scary of all these, just to kind of go through, and this will be a test question, is the AGE or ulterior gas embolism. That is the absolute scariest. Now, treatment of these is pretty straightforward. For now, over the, the AGE, that happens in the lungs? Um, it happens in the, in the stream, yeah. bloodstream, in, in the, the venous lungs. system or the, or the, and the veins. And it can go into the it can go into your nervous system, but it can go into your brain. Um, it's bubbles in the bloodstream, air bubble, specifically air bubbles in the bloodstream. Um, so overexpansion um, uh, the uh, prevention of it is pretty straightforward. Um, it can, they can, a lot of these can happen from sudden impact um, cr crashes, and and that's one of the reasons that uh, places like Ermac and Mountain View have uh, recompression chambers is because in a sudden impact, you can, um, it can actually force the air out of your lungs and to, to pop yeah. out. So they can put you into, a, um, uh, into uh, a, a chamber and they can help, help with that. They can also, if it's metastinal, they can uh, decompress using a needle. You're not gonna do that, right? Um, but th that's sudden impacts or holding your breath. Um, Overexpansion injury where the lungs will literally pop. And one of the things to be aware of, it doesn't take much pressure to, chain, to pop the lungs. In fact, for every one foot you rise in the water column, you change pressure by about a half a PSI. It takes two PSI to pop the lungs. If they're completely full, two PSI more, and they can pop. That's all it takes. So if you, as I'm rising the water column, that's four feet. Half PSI per foot and two PSI to pop. So four feet of water, you can actually cause an overexpansion injury. So in terms of one of the things we want to make sure we're doing is we're not we're breathing constantly, but we're also not ascending excessively quickly. We want to make sure we're taking our time for ascents to allow pressure to decrease. Now, the, the first aid and treatment of this is very simple for you guys. Get, treat for shock. Get them on oxygen. Get them hydrated. Lay them down. Reduce pressure. Lift their legs. Call 911. Get them on oxygen. The treatment for most diving-related injuries, um, unless it's a shark bite, is going to be auction. Even in that's probably auction, right? Um, but get them on auction, treat for shock, get them hydrated, get them laying down, get them unstressed, right? The less we can make that heart pump, the better our chances are. And always call 911. So the most serious lung overexpansion injury is what? Yeah, arterial gas embolism. So decompression sickness uh, or case haunts disease um, comes to us from the guys who were building the Brooklyn Bridge. What they did is they had these giant bells, and they called them caissons. And what they would do is they'd put workers in these bells, lower them down 200 feet to the base of the bridge, and they would do their work um, to build the bridge. And what they determined in the 1800s is as they pulled them back up, after a 12-hour shift, 15 to 30 minutes after they came back up, they would get really sick, great deals of pain, so much so that they would bend over. Thus, the bends. So as we kind of went through this process, we kind of started learning. And 
and uh, Paul Burt in the late 1800s and then um, up to uh, Workman in the in the 50s, um, they started getting the idea that, wait a minute, there's something going on. We need to figure this out. What's going on? And they, they started, they came up with the idea of the partial pressure idea that um, at one bar, we have in a cubic, one cubic inch of space, we have 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen. If we go down to two bar, 33 feet, in that same one cubic foot, cubic inch of space, now we have 158% total nitrogen and 42% oxygen. And so here's where it really gets slick. And this is one of the reasons I, I talk about nitrox so much as we look at this. If so, we were, yes, sir. So is that too much oxygen? Then? No, not yet. There are definitely limits on the amount of oxygen you can breathe. Um, and, and the total partial pressure oxygen is 1.4 that you should try and stay below. Okay. Um, nitrogen is a little bit different story. Uh, but we'll get into that in just a minute. So as we, um, as we get into this, we see that we're breathing a higher partial pressure of nitrogen. We're at this point at 33 feet, we're breathing 158% equivalent of nitrogen. Well, our body's all about equilibrium. As that nitrogen at the new partial pressure is going out, it's, it is perfusing into our tissue compartments, 16 different tissue compartments, and they all perfuse at different rates. So our fat is being perfused with 158%. Our brain's being perfused with 158%, right? The challenge is, as we come up in the water column, we're going to a lower partial pressure of nitrogen. As we come up, that lower partial pressure of nitrogen has to come out somehow. And the way it comes out is in the form of silent bubbles. And then it comes to bubble seeds. And then it comes up to symptomatic bubbles. It's those bubbles that ca were causing decompression sickness. So as we go deeper, the more dense the nitrogen becomes. As the nitrogen becomes more dense, it perfuses the tissues at that new density. As we come up, that nitrogen has to come out somehow, and it comes out again in this form of bubbles. So deeper, longer, more perfused tissue with nitrogen, and it's got to come out somehow. Here's where nitrox comes into this play. The same dive on 32% nitrox versus 21% air, and now all of a sudden we're breathing 32% oxygen and only 68% nitrogen versus 79 percent so as we go down to 33 feet we're only breathing 136 percent or 1.3 uh 1.36 uh, partial pressure of nitrogen versus 158 so less nitrogen you know the easiest way not to get a hangover um drinking beer not, <laughs> not drink not drink beer yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've learned over the course of my my life that if i drink less i have less hangover if I breathe less nitrogen, I have less chance of having nitrogen bubbles coming out of my system. That's where the safety partial, partial pressure comes in, is as I'm breathing less nitrogen, I have less nitrogen to come out of my system. I am thus safer. Um, I have less, a much less chance of getting the bends. Make sense? Okay. But, yeah. Absolutely. Question, but, um, so you mentioned, like, you'll feel better, things like that. So even if you take all the precautions to prevent this, breathing like the typical mix of nitrogen and oxygen can still feel not great sometimes. Well, here's the thing. So there's a few, there's a few reasons why breathing um, nitrox is, is, uh, gives you that better feeling. The, the first one, and this is my theory on this, and I've talked to several experts and they, they agree that, yes, it's a theory and yes, it makes sense, is that as your body is uptaking and uh, perfusing um, nitrogen into the system and then perfusing it out, it's working. Your tissues and muscles are working and doing something. So if you have to, if you work them less, you're less tired. Mm -hmm. That's the first part of it. Um, so you're going through less of that and less off gassing gotcha. is what we call it. Yeah. Um, the other part about it is as well, and the reason we say more energy is oxygen does have a slight narcotic effect. Absolutely. So as you kind of go through this process, two things actually happen. A, you're breathing more oxygen. But as you're going deeper into pressure, your brain kicks in and, and it gets screwed up on its, in its um, dynamic of how much oxygen should it be having because it wants to overcome the carbon dioxide issue uh, for hypercapnia. So what it'll do is it kicks over and says, wait a minute, we need more oxygen. We need more oxygen. We need more oxygen. So as it's getting this higher percentage of oxygen, it's also pushing more for more oxygen. And so now it's, it's flushing your body more with oxygen as well. 
So in giving you that, that uh, chemical reaction in your brain of more oxygen, which has that nar slight narcotic effect. So your body's doing less stuff and there's a slight narcotic effect. Okay. So those are the, the common answers, the easy ones. But that's, that's uh, why we push so hard for nitrox. Um, it's just, it's, there are some limitations to nitrox, nitrox absolutely. Um, and you kind of touched on one of them. There's only a, a certain amount of partial pressure of oxygen I can breathe. Absolutely. So there's a limit to the depth. It doesn't say I can go deeper, but it says I can stay longer at the depths I want to go to because I'm uptaking nitrogen. In truth, what the dive computer is doing is it's measuring the amount of nitrogen that's entering and exiting your system and how, how fast based upon an algorithm that's doing that. Nitrogen is absolutely positively the limiting factor to diving. It's what causes us, it's how we build the dive tables is based upon nitrogen absorption. And we're going to get into dive tables here in a little bit. So is nitrox now pretty common? Yes, it's okay. extremely common. Extremely. Mm -hmm. nice. Absolutely. Is that a recent thing? Or Since the 80s. Changing? Okay. Yep. So in air, at one atmosphere, the partial pressure of nitrogen is what? And oxygen is what? Hey, yeah, 79% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. The most efficient, efficient breathing pattern for scuba diving is... B. Absolutely. The longest answer, right? <laughs> so what we determined about decompression sickness is uh, we started off with um, Paul Burt in, in the late 1800s was doing auction studies on, and tried to figure this out. And along came Hal Dean. And Hal Dean was in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So at about 1902, 1904, he was working for the British Admiralty. And he determined, he was trying to figure out decompression sickness and why they were getting the bends. And what he determined was it was the gas. And he said, wait a minute figure this out. When we get to a doubling in pressure, we have to do a slower um, ascent and we have to do a safety stop to allow at a shallower depth to make sure we're allowing the gas to come out. So he came up with the idea that there's a two to one ratio of this. Now, interestingly enough, we still use Haldanian math even today in, in our algorithms. It's a very, it's a very common idea. Um, as we kind of went through the, the process, uh, Captain uh, Robert Workman in, in the uh, mid fifties, he was in a, a uh, uh, Coast Guard captain came along and he says, Haldine, you were so close. You were this close, but you missed it. What he determined was it wasn't just the total pressure, but it was the total pressure of one of the gases in the two gas mix that we're breathing right now of air. He said it was the nitrogen. He says, wait a minute. When we get, to, It's not when we get to doubling of pressure. It's when we get to doubling of pressure of nitrogen. So he came up with Workman's critical difference. And he said that at two atmospheres or when the Atmospheric pressure, or the pressure of nitrogen gets to double to 158%. That's when we need to worry. Thus, nitrox. Now, oddly enough, over time, working was proven wrong. And uh, we've gone back to Haldanian math. Um, and we've determined everything based upon a tissue compartment. But it gives you a better idea that once you get to that point of doubling the amount of pressure of nitrogen is when we need to start worrying. That we are too deep um, and we're going to need to do a slower ascent. And we're going to make sure we allow time for that nitrogen to blow off. So you say Workman was proven wrong? Workman was eventually proven wrong. So then... The basic idea is, is sound, but as we, as we moved into more advanced comp, uh, complications, we used Haldanian math um, to determine based upon, and we used uh, either Buhlmann, RGBM, uh, reduced gradient bubble model, or BPM, uh, BBM, very, great, uh, very uh, bubble model. So we, we're using a more advanced algorithm that takes into account, instead of just the gas, it takes into account the body, which is a little different than what they're saying. Uh, Haldane was on the idea of creating math against the body, and Workman came in and said, it, no, it's against the gas. And so he was eventually proven wrong, and, and Robert Buhlman, who was being funded by Exxon, oddly enough, um, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, and in, in, even in the 90s, um, came along and said, wait a minute, I see where you're going with this, and while your math is sound, there's a more accurate way to do this. We use, let's use this algorithm, and uh, he eventually built it up to where there's 16 tissue compartments that we're working against that all absorb and, and off-gas, and, and perfuse and diffuse at different rates. So Workman is, for, for, uh, for, for argument for today, um, it's close enough um, to give you at least the idea of what's going on. Um, and while it's, it's not exactly correct, 
Um, at least it gives you the idea of the here's what's going on. But the book didn't tell you who was who wrongly. Nope, it doesn't. <laughs> um, they keep it pretty simple. Um, but he was, absolutely. So decompression sickness, the signs and symptoms are pretty straightforward. Um, there's three levels of decompression sickness. And this is more common, which you'll see um, in um, what's going to happen. So level one is called skin bends or level one um, DCS, decompression sickness. And what that means is that nitrogen is trying to escape the body and it's small enough that it's going to try and perfuse through the skin. So you get a rash. Typically around the joints, but it could be anywhere. So if you get a rash after diving, there's, that could be a sign of that. But typically, really, pre precursor symptoms of DCS are going to be things like um, tiredness, nausea, dizziness, um, lethargy. Um, anything in, along those lines um, is going to be precursor signs of DCS. Sounds like a Monday morning. It can be, right? But as you, so the easy way I'd like to, you guys to think about this is as you feel going in the water is how you should feel coming out of the water. If you come out of the water with blurred vision, dizziness, something not right, right? Um, slurred speech, um, anything like that, be aware that there's probably something going on. Now, if you come out just nauseous, it certainly could be seasickness, but it could be DCS as well. Um, so just be aware, be very self-aware. Uh, I read a paper recently by um, a, a pulmonologist in Palau, and she determined that 60% of the cases that came into her clinic um, that were uh, were um, DCS, pre-DCS, 60%. It's pretty, so it's pretty common. It's, it's reasonably common. Yeah. So level two gets a little bit more in depth. As we start getting, that's when the bubbles have moved from silent um, to bubble seeds. They're getting larger uh, these, as, they, as we go along. And as they get larger, they start getting trapped in different places like your joints, that's a typically. So you start feeling joint pain in your hands, in your elbows, in your wrists, in your knees. And if you had joint pain going in and, and you have joint pain coming out, you probably have joint pain, right? But if you have new joint pains that you're not accustomed to, it's, it could be DCS. And level three is when we start getting um, uh, convulsions. We start passing out. Um, we start bedding over in ter terrible pain. That's level three. Now, the good news is this treatment for DCS is pretty simple. Um, first thing is we put them on auction, we hydrate them, we treat for shock, we lay them down, we get them relaxing because if we can get that heart rate down, it's going to allow the bubbles to perfuse more, diffuse, I'm sorry, more slowly through the process. Now, interestingly enough, as we go through DCS, one of the things that, uh, some of the things the book don't, does not talk about at all is how can we prevent DCS? Um, it absolutely talks about good safety stops, slow ascents, but here's the things that you can do to make sure you don't get DCS. It's been proven, and the Swedes did, uh, not sorry, not Swedes, um, the Dutch did a great study on this, and they determined a few interesting things. That if you exercise in aerobic manner for 20 minutes the day before a dive, you reduce your chances of getting DCS by an order of magnitude of five to 10 times. Uh, That's huge. Yeah. 20 minutes of aerobic exercise. Is it just because it's like your second blood oxygen? You know, you'd think that, but okay. what, what they actually determined was as you exercise, the body releases enzymes into the, uh, the venous mm -hmm. system um, that actually coat and lubricate, if you will, the venous system so that the, the bubbles no longer have something to grab onto and stop. Because if they can grab on, if a bubble can come along and get caught on something, another bubble can hit it and it will perfuse into that bubble. And as, as each, those bubbles hit each other, they perfuse to each other and they get larger and larger but it doesn't allow them to trap and get stopped. So that's, that's one way. Or jogging or walking or... Mm -hmm. Anything, get your heart rate up. Get to zone two. <laughs> yep, zone two or three. Yeah. Okay, cool. For 20 minutes, the okay. day, day prior to a dive, five to 10 time reduction in DCS. Does diving get you into those zones typically or maybe not? It's not quite, not slower. enough. Yeah, yeah okay. it's, uh, you'll get into the 90 to 100, rate, 100 uh, heart rates, but um, generally not too much. <laughs> but yeah, you definitely want to um, you definitely want to get to that aerobic twenty minute exercise, right? Okay. What you'll see is some of, really some advanced tech divers will um, as they the day before they go for a run, a good run the day before. Um, other things you can do: good hydration. If we think about it, the blood is like the conveyor belt of the body, right? Its whole job is to move stuff from here to there. If it's not if you're not well hydrated, you haven't lubed um, the conveyor belt. It's going to go slower. It's going to have a harder time. So good hydration, reasonable hydration. Now, at, with that along, I will tell you there are two types of divers in this world. Ready for this? Yeah, 
Have you heard this already? No. Yes. There's ones who pee in their wetsuits and there's ones who lie about it. Just my pro tip for the day is pee at the beginning of the dive, not at the end. <laughs> it happens. We all do it. We don't do it in dry suits, but it happens. So good hydration prior to the dive. And they also proved uh, in the same study that, um, through some process that staying warm, warmth, staying warm during um, and, um, and throughout a dive will help you re help reduce DCS dramatically. Now, the easiest way to stay warm is just make sure we have the proper thermal protection. And what we talked about on Monday, the idea that uh, good thermal protection has a buoyancy factor to it, keeps us warm. There's also a very sound reason to have thermal for thermal protection in that it keeps you warm and it'll help you prevent from having DCS. So good hydration, good rest, um, exercise the day before, and thermal protection. You reduce your order of magnitude dramatically of chances of getting DCS. So making sure to, to keep that up um, and make sure you're in, in physical shape for the dive. I mean, certainly, you know, we all hear about this 60 year old guy that uh, has an office job and, and uh, very uh, slightly overweight, um, but decides to go on a dive trip and do three days for five straight days. That's the equivalent of running 15 miles three times a day or three times uh, three or 15 miles a day for five straight days. Sorry. So certainly this is a sport make sure you're physically fit, yeah. but here's some, those are some tips. Um, they won't be in the book um, that will help reduce your chances of getting DCS dramatically overall. So um, again, and again, the treatment for you is very simple. Get them laying down, treat them for shock, get them on auction, um, get them hydrated, call 911 or the Coast Guard. And what if it's like so mild and you're not sure, like will it eventually go away on its own or? It certainly can. Yeah, okay. absolutely. But like anything. How long could the symptoms last, last if they go on two days? A, a um, couple days. Okay. Um, it depends on how severe the DCS is. Okay, right. You know. If it's mild, though. If yeah. it's mild, it's yeah. a couple days at most. Yeah, okay. And then if you do feel that you've gotten DCS, don't dive the next day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, overall. So was it 20 minutes of uh, aerobic exercise? 24. 24 hours before. The study actually said 19 hours specifically. Was, very was It was, it was very like the optimal time. Was like, it was like the ultimate, ultimate time, but... 24 hours prior, is you're still going to get the benefits. The day before. Perhaps. Yeah, the day stay before. Down. Stay hydrated, stay warm during the dive, and get a good night's sleep. Absolutely. So it's, it's never a good idea. We Nikki and I have done this. We uh, Last year, we spent two weeks in Florida and did like 30 dives in two weeks. Um, but um, our first plane was delayed getting out. We almost missed our second plane. Um, and the, the second plane was delayed getting out. And, and uh, then they lost our luggage. And, and uh, so we, we landed. In, we were supposed to land in Fort Lauderdale at 10. We ended up landing at midnight. Um, and then, then we had, yeah, we had a mix. So we didn't get to the car till 1 o'clock. Our, our baggage wasn't coming in till 2. Luckily, called the dive shop because we had to pick up our own tanks. And they stayed at till uh, till two a.m. for us. Oh my god! So we came, went over, picked up our because our boat was leaving at six o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock the next morning, and so we got, um, got over, got our tanks, got back over, got our gear. Um, we hit the hotel room at like three thirty in the morning, um, <laughs> slept for a couple hours, and then drove uh, drove for the dive. It was they were, we did fine on the dives, but they weren't the most enjoyable dives we yeah, did all all, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> so make sure you plan accordingly. So, which of the following would be inappropriate treatments for a diver exhibiting DCS symptoms? Like him underwater. Absolutely. Would, is there a situation where you would ignore them? Absolutely. If, they, okay. if their hearts start beating? Well, like if, if they were in like that level mm -hmm. of stuff. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, we don't take them underwater because there certainly are other issues. And the problem is, is using my AAD underwater is not very, as much fun as you might think it might be. If they do uh, stop breathing or there are other yeah. complications, I can't control those. Yeah. And there are certainly some uh, uh, situations where I've heard, heard people doing that, but it's just not a good idea. Now, typically, just to kind of finish up on DCS, DCS generally presents about 16 minutes after the dive. 16? 16. Oh, 16. Okay. Yeah, not as soon as you come out of the water, but about 16 minutes out of, out of the water. So... Proper ascent techniques, as we kind of look through this process, one of the things we want to be aware of is we talked a little bit about this earlier is Boyle's Law is can be our friend. It can be a, very much against us. So what we're going to do is, as we remember, we're always team diving. We're always this close. All right. You okay? Go up. Okay. 
we're facing each other. We both agreed we're going to go up. Okay, we grab that inflator. We're going to go and let some of the air out, and we're going to start a gentle swim ascent to the surface. But we're going to let the a little gas out first, because as we come to the yeah, because we don't want to pop up too quickly. Once we get up uh, to a certain uh, certain point, we're going to stop and we're going to do what's called a safety stop. Now we're going to talk more about the safety stop and body decompression in just a moment. There is one more issue that we need to talk about, and that's called nitrogen narcosis. Nitrogen narcosis is often called the rapture of the deep, um, the dark mistress, um, goofy gas. And so overall, what happens with uh, nitrogen narcosis, I'm going to, I thought I had another one in here, I don't. Uh, with nitrogen narcosis, I, I'm going to skip the video today is that nitrogen begins, starts to become narcotic after 60 feet at a high enough partial pressure at about 240% partial pressure of 2.4%, uh, 2.4 partial pressure of nitrogen, nitrogen starts creating a narcotic effect. There's a lot of theories on why that is overall. Uh, the most popular one, Myers-Overton, where it basically says that uh, the, the narcotic effect of nitrogen starts interrupting the ability of the neurons to connect, right? So nitrogen narcosis is pretty straightforward. It um, creates a narcotic effect on the body. So if you see your, your buddy all of a sudden acting goofy, they're brave, they're going too deep, they're laughing uncontrollably, um, they're uh, doing anything that's outside of the norm, there's a good chance they could be narked, narc uh, forgetting parts of the dive. We, Nikki and I were doing a, a deep dive with Lady Luck. We were swimming around an eight-foot seahorse. Big gold no eight. No way. What? It, 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 it's a statue. It's a, oh, it's a, it's a, I thought you meant like a, a real statue. Oh, no, it's an eight-foot statue of okay. a, a big gold statue of a, a seahorse. And we're, we're swimming around this, and, and this, there was this couple that came down. They swam around for a little while. And they, they swam around this seahorse quite a bit, and then they left. And, and later on, we got back on the boat, and, and the husband was asking the wife, what would you think of the seahorse? And she looked at him and said, what seahorse? Oh. And he said, the eight-foot gold seahorse? And she's like, I didn't see a seahorse. They were deep enough that she was narked. Nitrogen narcosis is absolutely a thing. Yeah. So it's one of those things that starts happening. Um, you can build up tolerance to it and understanding. And, and the best, the idea is, is that um, it's just like drinking. For example, um, I'm a cheap drunk. If I, if I drank one tall boy and tried to drive, I'd probably crash. I, I just don't drink, right? Uh, my son-in-law could drink a six-pack of Tall Boys and still uh, walk a straight line. He's still drunk, absolutely. Yeah. But he's learned through conditioned response how to handle that better. And you can certainly do the same thing with nitrogen narcosis as well. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is I teach a deep class, and, and we'll do eight math problems at the surface, and they're all single-digit plus single-digit. One plus eight, seven plus two, three plus six. They're all simple Two rows of them, big letters. I have my students do them at the surface. It usually takes about 10 seconds for them to do all eight. It's definitely not rocket science, right? I take them down to 100 feet, and I have them do the same math problems. It usually takes them about a minute to a minute and a half to do the same math problems. It's a very s subtle killer. I don't know if you've ever drank at a bar, sitting at a bar stool, and then suddenly stood up. Yeah. Right? You don't think you're, you're and then you're like, oh, hello, you know? So it's definitely a, a subtle thing. Um, so as you kind of go through this, one of the things I like to do through all dives is I constantly check my cognitive ability. One, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. I do basic math. I'm at 99 feet, three minutes, um, or one minute per 33 feet of a set rate, uh, plus a three minute safety stop means that I can come up in six minutes, right? Simple math. If I can't do simple math like that, then I know that there's something going on. I need to go ahead and ascend to shallower water. And that's when you say. Exactly. And do you have to go all the way up or no. like ascend and check nope. your ability? If you're getting to the point where you're feeling giddy, you're feeling sleepy, um, you're feeling any of the signs and symptoms of nitrogen narcosis, ascend till the symptoms go away. And if they're severe enough, go ahead and ascend all the way. But, and then don't descend below that level again. Yeah. That's the, the treatment for nitrogen narcosis is very simple. Ascend in the water column. That's why you're, you're limited currently to 60 feet. The prevention is pretty simple. Don't dive deep and without experience, without training. Um, now, the nice thing is, is um, nitrox does help this as well. Because you're breathing less nitrogen, it becomes less narcotic. So we start looking at what we call the equivalent narcotic depth as we start um, teaching nitrox. And we start getting the idea that 
wait a minute, if I'm diving 32% nitrox, my narcotic depth is now 99 feet instead of 66 feet. So I, I, I have a deeper depth before the signs and symptoms of nitronarcosis will start to appear. Um, other things to be aware of, oxygen toxicity, where we're starting to breathe a high percentage of oxygen, we definitely need to be aware of that. And oxygen toxicity is absolutely something that can happen. Um, the other one that we really need to, uh, that is more common and we start going into deep diving is called hypercapnia. The gas that we're breathing actually gets, has a weight to it. Right now we're breathing at about 1.28 grams per liter weight, or density, not, not weight, get density, I'm sorry. As gas gets, um, we go down, it gets compressed, it has a greater density, it's thicker, right? Um, so at right now at the surface, 1.28 is grams per liter. As we get deeper, it starts getting thicker and thicker and thicker. And when it hits to about 5.2 grams per liter, which is about 100 and, uh, 101 feet on air, on 21% air, 101 feet is 5.2 grams per liter. What happens with this dense gas is it doesn't allow our body and our lungs to exchange the oxygen the same way. And we have a higher carbon dioxide retention in not only our lungs, but in our bloodstream as well. And carbon dioxide uh, retention is called hypercapnia. Um, and it, it mimics most of the same signs and symptoms of nit uh, narcosis. They look very similar. Some of the differences. Um, you, where you get to the point where you're breathing very heavily or heavy breathing, it becomes harder to breathe. If you notice that you're really breathing through that hardcore anxiety, uh, feeling of panic or paranoia, um, those are absolutely, those are light symptoms of nitrogen narcosis, heavy symptoms of car, uh, hypercapnia. That's absolutely something that can happen, right? So just be aware. As you go deeper, there definitely are other things to be aware of. So here's where we get into kind of the meat and the potatoes, and I'd like to pick this up after a break give you guys a chance to, sure. to relax for a minute.